Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. We are smack in the middle of the greatest weekend on Earth, my friends. Fourth of July weekend here in the States, which we know other countries celebrate too because of their great admiration for us and the easy excuse to grill up some wieners and enjoy a cold beer. Speaking of which, this is Supplication Ale from Russian River Brewing in case you were wondering and cheers. Thanks for being here, patriots. And thank you for taking a brief pause from the weekend's various diversions to catch up on the star-spangled week of tech news, where CPUs keep getting faster, the GPUs keep getting more laughable, and routers are secretly plotting against you in your sleep. Happy America Day, everyone. It's time for tech news. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by the new Lightwings fans from Be Quiet, which combine legendary near silent operation with optimal performance and of course, RGB lighting. Control the look of your PC with up to 20 addressable LEDs per fan and choose from standard PWM for airflow or PWM high speed for use with radiators and heat sinks. They're available in 120 millimeter and 140 millimeter sizes and suitable for any build in need of a functional and tasteful RGB upgrade. So for more on the new Lightwings fans from Be Quiet, click the sponsor link in the video description. We begin this week's journey with a big ol' slap in the face from NVIDIA, metaphorically speaking of course, but it still stings, represented by the launch of their newest and slowest current gen GPU, the GTX 1630. It doesn't seem to matter what angle you look at it from, the GTX 1630 just sucks. It's based on last gen touring architecture, it offers less than half the performance of the universally panned RX 6500 XT, in fact it can't even keep up with the RX 6400 which is 50 to 60% faster according to Tech Power Up. And all this might even be forgivable if the 1630 was reasonably priced, but it is not, starting at $170 for entry level variants which likely means AIB partners will have no problem charging $180 to $200 plus for special specially designed versions with an extra heat pipe or some RGB lighting, consider that the Radeon RX 6400, which again is 50 to 60% faster, 57% faster here at 1080, costs 160 bucks. Consider that the GTX 1650 Super, which offers more than double the performance, 213% here, launched in 2019 for 10 bucks less with a $160 MSRP, and even though it's still overpriced, it can be found right now on Newegg for $200, add to cart, Although again, the Radeon cards in this range offer more performance per dollar if you're legitimately hunting for an entry level GPU right now. I think my favorite visual for this launch is the Guru 3D review of Palette's GTX 1630 Dual, which requires you to scroll and scroll and scroll quite a bit actually to get down to the 1630s score in their Time Spy shootout. My favorite reviewer reaction was confusion, which also seemed to be a theme. Reviewers who were baffled by the card's performance and positioning had to dig deep to try to figure out NVIDIA's reasoning behind the launch. Did NVIDIA uncover a stash of broken TU-117 GPUs that it had hoarded away, asks PC Gamer. I think it's more likely that NVIDIA thinks they're still riding the take advantage of the GPU shortage wave of the last couple years, and they assume buyers aren't savvy enough to realize the markets have shifted. Whatever the case, NVIDIA, please don't piss on our legs and tell us it's raining. Nobody should buy this waste of a GPU, and if you want one last stark comparison, consider that the GTX 1630 offers the same performance as a GTX 1050 Ti, which launched six years ago in 2016 for 140 US dollars versus 170. That's a great way to insult your customers, NVIDIA. Meanwhile, over in CPU rumor land, we have a follow-up to last week's leaked Intel Core i9-13900 benchmarks, this time with what seems to be a more fully enabled 13900K. The benchmark results come from Chip Hell forum member Lords and should be taken with a grain of salt since we're still likely months from launch, but they did include a high-res image of one of their chips that looks to be legitimate. Whereas last week's engineering sample results were derived from an ES1 chip or a first-gen batch, the new results are said to be from a third third round of samples or ES3. Both test results are shown here and you can see the boost gained since the ES1 unit could only hit 4 GHz across all cores versus the ES3 chip which gets to 5.5 GHz single core and 5.3 GHz on all cores. This allowed the Raptor Lake flagship to beat the previous gen 12900K by 7% in single threaded tests and a big old 28% in multi-threaded tests. Compared to AMD's 5950X, it is 34% faster single threaded and 21% ahead when using all cores and threads. The 13900K won't really
really be up against the 5950X though. It will face off against AMD's yet to be launched Zen 4 based Ryzen 7000 series on the AM5 platform. So while Intel fans have a lot to be excited about with Raptor Lake, it's likely that AMD will beat Intel to the punch with the fall launches since the rumored mid-September release date for AM5 has now been further bolstered by a Digitimes Asia article posted Wednesday. Late 2022 is looking like the beginning of a glorious new era for home computing though, as chips with more cores, more cache, and five to six gigahertz clock speeds are coming down the pipeline from AMD and Intel. And I truly hope it's a neck and neck battle which would be best for consumers. So to Team Red and Team Blue, I wish you good fortune in the wars to come. Speaking of more cache, AMD has already proven that CPUs outfitted with more of the stuff do a better job at gaming. And we already know that they're planning to use their 3D vCache packaging technology to create Raphael X Zen 4 CPUs with added cache for AM5. But ever since 3D vCache was introduced at Computex in June 2021, questions have lingered about how much stacking that cache on top of the CPU dies might affect cooling performance. Until now, it was simple enough to compare the 5800X 3D to the standard 5800X to determine that yes, it does run hotter. But as of last week, a Twitter user with the very appropriate handle madness7771 has revealed that you can mitigate those temperatures by delitting a 5800X 3D or removing the soldered heat spreader, which is extremely dangerous because it's soldered and you can easily damage the die while doing it. But insanity drives one to do outlandish things. And after overcoming the general malaise that only the genius possess in the insane lament, Madness 7771 apparently used razor blades and sheer will to accomplish the task. And then used the original IHS, replacement conductonaut thermal interface material and a Noctua NHD14 cooler to test the changes while gaming. Temps dropped from 78 degrees Celsius on average down to 67, with max temps dropping 10 degrees from 80 down to 70. The CPU also no longer hits 90 degrees Celsius max during regular mixed use and was able to run at the max turbo frequency of 4.45 gigahertz instead of throttling down to 4.3. While this likely isn't a practical mod for most users given the risks of delitting a soldered IHS, it does indicate that AMD could be leaving some performance on the table with their current heat spreader mounting methods. And while mass production solutions typically settle on something that's a balance between performance and cost for the manufacturer, I'd be curious to see if AMD considers doing something special for a more limited run of Ryzen 7000 X3D Raphael X CPUs to maximize cooling and performance to go all out for a flagship gaming CPU. Some good news came through Monday for anyone who is languishing on the Steam Deck waiting list. Valve says they are ramping up Steam Deck production and Q3 reservation emails will be going out this week, which seemed early to me since it's not actually Q3 yet, but actually, oh yeah, it's July now and it totally is. 2022 is already more than halfway over. I have no idea how this happened. I'll have another sip of beer. Anyway though, you might have already gotten an email about your Steam Deck reservation, but if not, you can go to store.steampowered.com slash Steam Deck while logged in to check your reservation status. Maybe do that soon though, as you only have 72 hours to complete the transaction once you're notified, so double check your payment and shipping info and all that. Incidentally, I was way behind with ordering mine, although I finally reserved one back in March, but Valve still tells me it's probably not gonna be available until after Q3 or October, 2022. Anyone else out there and the Q4 crew. Hopefully they can set me up before Christmas, which seems possible since they've now doubled the number of Steam Decks they're shipping per week. Speaking of doubling up, did you know tech briefs squeeze twice the amount of tech news into half the amount of time? Just like my tidy whities actually. Before you go checking my math though, maybe you should check your router to make sure it's not infected with Zuorat, stealthy new malware that has been targeting at least 80 different router models from Cisco, Netgear, Asus, and Draytech. This remote access Trojan is described as unusually sophisticated, so I assume it prefers white tie formal wear and was developed by an advanced hacking group with an intentionally complex control infrastructure so it can obfuscate its existence on your network. Fortunately, the initial infection can be cleared out with a simple router reboot, but a factory reset is recommended to be safe. If you think you might be at risk, check the article for more information. The cryptocurrency world continues to be rocked by falling prices and bear market conditions, and stories like this don't help much. 
Coinbase, the crypto giant who recently laid off 1,100 employees, has apparently been selling geo-tracking data on its users to ICE, or the U.S. Department of Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. ICE purchased an analytics software license from Coinbase back in August 2021, and watchdog group Tech Inquiry has now revealed that it can be used to track transactions made through nearly a dozen different digital currencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, and Tether. And while blockchain ledgers are public by design, one of the shining ideals of cryptocurrency is maintaining anonymity while you buy and sell things that may or may not be illegal, like back when Bitcoin was mostly used to buy drugs on the dark web. I guess crypto just doesn't work like it used to, though. And remember, you can't spell decentralized without the CIA. Speaking of cryptocurrency's ongoing crisis, there is yet another unrecognized victim in these tumultuous markets, NFTs. And by unrecognized, I mean the artwork they are minted from is often unrecognizable from a drunken two-year-old's first attempt at finger painting. Aesthetics aside, though, NFTs truly appear to have been a flash in the pan in terms of value and long-term viability, as the Wall Street Journal reports that prices have fallen off a cliff and exchanges are seeing sale volume drop to levels not seen since a year ago in June 2021, when you maybe hadn't even heard of NFTs and had one less thing to be angry at the existence of. Even the infamous bored apes have seen their yacht club run aground, with prices down 30% or more in the past month, prompting many to ask, if I can't resell unenforceable digital ownership of this stupid monkey picture, is the economy truly doomed? The answer is yes, but not for that reason. Now, if you've been experiencing some economic or what the heck, existential anxiety lately, perhaps you can take comfort in the fact that soon you might be able to play ray traced games on your phone. That's right, ray tracing, that thing Nvidia spoiled everyone's enthusiasm for back when the RTX 20 series launched because they thought it was a good excuse for criminally overcharging for their GPUs, now available in the Immortalis G17. ARM's new flagship GPU. So you can play ray traced games on your phone, which is really what everyone was asking for this year since it will solve all of our problems. Immortalis is kind of a cool name though, but perhaps a bit hyperbolic given that most phones last for maybe two or three years max. If you think this development will bring new meaning to your life, save the date for ARM's webinar on August 24th, where they'll reveal more. And finally, we have a very long awaited update for the 3DFX Voodoo 5 graphics card, eliciting praise from many a retro PC gamer who had written off 3DFX as a dead company. Indeed, despite its impressive hardware configuration with two VSA100 chips and 64 megabytes of 166 megahertz SD RAM, the Voodoo 5 5500, launched in June of the year 2000, has suffered recently from a shortage of CRT gaming monitors to connect to and an annoying lack of widescreen 16x9 support. But that is now solved with the publication of the 3DFX Wide Driver by Dolenk over on the 3DFX Zone forums, which adds not just 16x9 support, but also ultra-wide 21x9 resolution support for OpenGL, Direct3D, and Glide games. So grab yourself a motherboard with an AGP port, fire up Windows 98, and game on. But there you have it guys, tech news for the week, so happy 4th of July to all of my fellow Americans and non-Americans alike, because I think today should be a good day, even if it's not the anniversary of your nation's victory over tyrannical British imperialism. And since we're all in such a good mood, maybe click that like button on your way out, or leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the description. If you're interested, check out my store at paulsharbread.net for high quality merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies, beer sets, and more. Subscribing to my channel is always a good call too. Thanks again, everyone. Cheers, and we'll see you next week.